Shabbat Shalom. A significant challenge imposed by the current pandemic has been the need for many brides and grooms to postpone or alter wedding plans. I've been dealing with several couples who have either postponed or changed venues for their weddings in order to meet these challenges, going from major hotels often to backyards or other very smaller, less ostentatious uh, surroundings in order to fulfill their dream and uh, stand under a chuppah and get married. An opportunity perhaps is suggested in the uh, late 19th century in Eastern Europe for a different type of venue for a wedding, which became known in history as a Schwarze Chassene. Don't worry, this has nothing to do with race. A Schwarze Chassene, a black wedding, was a marriage ceremony conducted during a pandemic in a cemetery to confuse God, likely to confuse the shade and the evil spirits that lurk at weddings and at funerals, not knowing exactly what was going on here. And this purpose was to end the pandemic. So the communities would seek out a couple, never usually an unfortunate couple, who could not afford the Four Seasons or a nice wedding venue, and convince or coerce them to be married in a cemetery among the dead. And uh, that practice was highlighted in an article last Sunday in the New York Times, based on an earlier article in Tablet Magazine, Jewish online journal in March. So let me briefly quote from Steve Brill's article in last Sunday's Times. He writes that a wedding a century ago in New York took place not in spite of the Spanish flu epidemic ravaging the city, but precisely because of it. What's more, both the dead and the living were at the ceremony. The, no the November 4th, 1918 edition of the Evening World had the story. In Mount Hebron Cemetery, Miss Rose Schwartz stood beside Abraham Lachterman, and before them stood Rabbi Unger, who performed a wedding, a wedding ceremony. The tradition upon which the couple acted is an ancient Jewish one, which declares that the only way to stop a plague is to hold a marriage ceremony in the cemetery. The newspaper said 2,000 people cheered on the couple for offering themselves up to stop the epidemic. The gathering in Queens, New York was known as the Schwarze Chassene, Black Wedding, a ritual that was brought over from Eastern Europe during the Spanish flu epidemic, which claimed more than 20,000 lives in New York City, tens of millions of victims worldwide. The same ceremony was reintroduced in cemeteries in Philadelphia and in Winnipeg. And in Winnipeg, we are told in 1918 at the Schwarze Chassene, there was a, a wedding taking place at the same time that a funeral service was taking place in another side of the cemetery. The idea behind the Schwarze Chassene by the Black Wedding, the uh, Philadelphia Press reported, was so that the attention of God would be called to the affliction of their fellows in the most humble of circumstances so that they would join with the dead in order to be married. I'm not going to suggest that uh, there will be a mass movement to hold weddings in cemeteries. First of all, Cemeteries have very low quotas, so you could not have 2,000 people coming to a chasana at a cemetery, and it is not a custom that we necessarily want to revive in the COVID-19 pandemic. But it does suggest that 
There were many customs that were brought over from the Alta Haim, from the old country, at the uh, turn of the 20th century, that were not, not necessarily customs that we would want to emulate, that reflected a certain darkness, similar to many of the superstitions that came over from Eastern Europe and became part of many Jewish households, some of them maintained until this very moment. The late Rabbi Wolf Kelman, who uh, was executive vice president of the Rabbinical Assembly, a leader in the conservative movement in American Jewry, of course, emanating from Toronto, brother of our late neighbor and friend, Rabbi Joe Kelman, Allah Shalom. Wolf would tell a story that uh, if one were to send deep sea drivers, sorry, deep sea divers into the mid Atlantic, halfway between Hamburg and New York, they would discover millions of pairs of tefillin that were thrown overboard during the great immigration between 1881 and 1924. This uh, goes back to a a tradition or a, a folk belief that the vast majority of Jews who came over from the old country threw their, their tefillin overboard, in a sense jettisoned their connection to Jewish tradition in their attempt to integrate into the new world. And so we see there was this sense that uh, customs that were held on to were often the dark customs, the Schwarze Chasana customs, the superstitions, those were held on to, but a lot of the authentic Jewish traditions were not. They were jettisoned and they were to be forgotten. Of course, that is a very exaggerated myth. I'm sure that many Jews brought their tefillin with them when they were able to and did not throw them into the sea. Maybe a handful did. But uh, we know that in order to make it into in the Naya Velt in the New World, there was a need to accommodate, which for many people meant no longer being able to maintain Shabbat, etc., when they had to work to make a living. So there are examples of things that we took over from the old country, from the past, that uh, are interesting, not necessarily at the highest level of inspiration, but there are other things that we brought over from the past, whether it were Jews who emigrated from Europe or from North Africa, from Sephardic communities, traditions that would enrich their lives and make a huge difference. One of the things that were brought over, of course, were songs, music, childhood lullabies that were sung in Shtetlach and then brought over here. And I, I suspect that many of generations who were born in this country were regaled with lullabies that a bubi or a great grandmother had sang when they were in the old country. Elie Wiesel would tell the story of. Uh, how the song Oithen Pripachuk, Brenta Fajrul, how that continued to inspire him as a very young child, as a toddler. He has memories of his mother singing the song to him, which continued to resonate in his mind to the very end of his life. And so the spiritual inspiration from the past was something that would continue to enrich his life to its very end. Pirkei Avot tells us, Dame ayin bata, ulana taholech. Know from where you come and where you are heading. Commentators have suggested that the juxtaposition of those two brief statements suggests that it is knowing from where you've come that enables you to set forth your path to tomorrow. There is a direct connection between May Ayin Bata, from your, where you've come from, the Alta Haim, and Lana uh, Taholech, where the future will take you. And so those 
memories are so central to what being a Jew is all about. And so to our parasha of Shalach Lecha, I'm just going to focus on the Maftir, the very concluding verses, which are well known to Jews who go to shul, who pray, the daven, parasha tzitzit, the third paragraph of the Shema, the commandment to wear tzitzit on your clothing. And uh, our tradition tells us that uh, the text that re- of tzitzit is one that legislates memory. You got to remember who you are from where you've come and what that legacy is all about. And you know that memory is a foundation of Jewish tradition. Shabbat, we're now entering Shabbat. Shabbat is Zifron Lama Asevere Shit. It is a remembrance, a memory of creation. Alternatively, it is viewed as Zecher Yitziat Mitzrayim. It's a memory of the Exodus from Egypt that led us to becoming a nation. Rosh Hashanah Yom HaZikaron, the day of remembering. Zichronot, one of the major thematic units of that most holy of days. Referred to weddings earlier, a wedding tradition. Imeshkachech Yerushalayim, if I forget Jerusalem, I will lose all my power. I will lose my identity. Remembering Yerushalayim, the direction we face under the chuppah, the purpose of many of the wedding rituals, including how we understand the breaking of the glass, remembering its destruction, and other traditions that bring Yerushalayim, the memory of that center point of our faith into that very significant moment of our lives. I'm going to conclude with two tzitzit stories. Again, tzitzit, that agent that is designated Laman Tizkuru, so that you remember. You remember who you are from where you've come, what your life as a Jew is all about. So the first one is personal. 39 years ago, I was traveling in what was then still the Soviet Union for the purpose of visiting Seruvnikim, Refuseniks, who had applied for exit visas to Israel and were harassed and persecuted as a result. So I'm arriving with my travel partner, Moscow Airport, which is a rather intimidating experience going through security and customs in in Moscow, especially when we were bringing several items that we were going to be leaving with Jews. And uh, so there's a certain amount of trepidation as we entered that process. I remember this customs official going through my luggage and he pulls out my talus. He says, with a, in a heavy Russian accent, this is uh, for prayer, right? So I said, yeah, it's for prayer, yes. I was impressed because I think that most customs officials in North America would have no idea what a talus is, but he knew what a talus was. So he continues to search through my luggage and he finds a second talus. And now I knew I was in trouble. So he said, well, why do you need two? So I had to come up with an explanation as to why I need two. And I wasn't going to say because I was going to leave both of them with Jews in Russia. So I said, uh, well, that's in case I lose the first one. And he let me go. He let me in. And uh, I made it. And I was able to leave the Talitot and the Tzitzit for Jews of the Soviet Union who really wanted to hold on to those memories 
of what a Jew meant. Lamantis keruva asitem. So that you remember and fulfill your life as a Jew. So important to them to sustain them through those very dark and difficult times. And my final tzitzit story, Shabbat, involves our late beloved Rabbi Pappenheim, Zechert Tzadik Livracha. We used to have great conversations on Shabbat morning. I was only together with him for like two and a half years. But I really remember those times, my early, my earliest days at Beth David. And uh, it was always fun because he would, uh, you know, the, the private conversations, which thankfully we could not record because it was Shabbat, they were, they were really instructional. They were often funny because he had a great sense of humor. But uh, it was on uh, Shabbat Shalach Lecha. We're talking uh, 38 years ago when we're reading the parsha Tzitzit. And he said to me, you know, when I was a kid in Frankfurt, in Germany, in the 1930s, we went to public school and we wore tzitzit. We wore the tallest cut and the, under the clothing tzitzit. We'd have gym class and we'd have to show our non-Jewish classmates who we were. He said he realized later how courageous that was, but at time, at the time, he did it because that's what they did. Lamanti's Skuru, remembering above everything else that he was a Jew, even at the time of the rise of Nazism in the 1930s, in those terribly dark times leading to even worse days for our people. Lamanti Skuru. That tzitzit, that symbol of connection, so important. Much of life today centers on what we remember from the past. Some of the memories, like the Schwarze Hassan, and they bring a smile to our faces because of the bizarre nature of those memories and how they were transported in the early years of the 20th century to North America. Others are customs that our grandparents or our parents bequeathed to us coming from the old country, not always knowing what they represented, but this is the way things were done and we continue in those ways. But the most special memories that really sustain us as a people are the tzitzit memories, the lamantis kuru, so that you will remember and fulfill yourselves as a Jew through those memories. Those are the memories that sustain us that give us hope even in dark days, and that tell us that we have a future, that we have hope, that better days are certainly, with God's help, destined to come. Can you hear that song? Shabbat Shalom.